who have titled this message, Preparing Us for the Coming Age, Our Most Important Job Ever. We, as God called, are the ones he wants to help in him administer his coming kingdom. This is our time for learning and preparing. All that we do now is to better prepare us to perform those tasks then. We, above all people, have to pay attention now. We know that as we obey the commandments of God and keep his Sabbaths and holy days, as he laid out, we become a focused target of Satan. As long as we stay true to God and do not fall into the present age of sin and cultural paganism, we will continue to be in Satan's sights. It's interesting when we see all of the different Christian groups and denominations and churches there are, some 37,000 by one count. Most worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, celebrate Christmas, Easter, and Halloween. The mainstream churches say these don't apply because they're Jewish days. This is the basis for their change in the fourth century. They did not want to Judaize the Sabbath and the holy days, a lame excuse by a politically motivated uh, dictator. Let's see whose days they really are. Please turn to Leviticus 23, and we'll start in verse 1. In Leviticus 23, here we find the weekly Sabbaths and holy days set out in one area. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, He told Moses to speak to all of the twelve tribes, not just Judah, concerning the appointed feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my appointed feast. Twice God states they are his feast. He states this five times in this chapter alone. He also states four times they are to be kept forever throughout your generations. The rest of the 44 verses list the weekly Sabbaths and the holy days of God, their times, specifics on how we would honor God in them. We can also find them referenced in Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and as well as individually in various parts of the Old and New Testament. As a New Testament church, we know, which we are part of, kept all of God's holy days. Not only is the weekly Sabbath found in Leviticus, it's also found, first mentioned in Genesis. As we noted, it is listed as the fourth commandment spoken by God to the children of Israel in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. The true churches of God honor the Sabbaths and holy days as God set them forth, and do not honor or participate in the Satan-inspired pagan holidays, most of which date back to Babylon. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, and we'll start in verse 9, and read that and think for a moment. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Think of how blessed we are that we've been called into God's family. As it states, God is faithful. Because he is, we know we can depend upon his word. One of the things that's hard for me to wrap my head around is how these Sunday churches say that the law is done away with. They claim to read and know the Bible, but by their actions they deny it. The example I'll use is in Matthew 5, in verse 17, uh, verses 17 to 19. So we go to Matthew 5, we'll start in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. But truly I say to you, until the heaven and the earth shall pass away. This present heaven and earth haven't passed away yet. We're still here. We can still see it. One jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law until everything has been fulfilled. Therefore, whoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall practice and teach them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How does a stated Bible-believing church read this and then actually try to justify what they do? It would seem they take each verse of the Bible they agree with and try to make doctrine from it, excluding all others that may tend to clarify or explain it more fully. By not following the entire Bible and using the Bible to interpret the Bible and putting their emphasis on the New Testament, they can completely dismiss many things. By dismissing or minimalizing the Old Testament, they miss important instruction. Let's turn to Ezekiel 20 and start in verse 18. Ezekiel 20 and verse 18. But I said to the children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do them. And keep my Sabbaths holy. And they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. 
be a sign. It's pretty interesting they, they missed that. To make sure that we're prepared for what God is preparing for us, we cannot be that narrow-minded. We know how to properly study and apply these true principles of study, and we must be doing it. We've all gone through our own life experiences, good times, struggles, trials, blessings. We also have this in common. We have been brought to this place at this time by the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Let's turn to Luke 10, and we'll start there in verse 21. Luke 10, in verse 21. In the same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You did hide these things from the wise and intelligent and did reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for it was well-pleasing in your sight to do so. Then he turned to the disciples and he said, All things were delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son personally chooses to reveal him. That's us, brethren. He's revealing him each time we get together on a Sabbath. And there in the presence of God, we're being taught by God. He's revealing the Father to us. And he turned to his disciples and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that have seen the things you have seen. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see the things you see and have not seen them, and to hear the things that you hear and have not heard them. Not only have we been blessed in seeing and hearing these things, but he's also given us the understanding and a heightened ability to discern his truth. The more we commit to God, the greater our understanding. God is continually building and refining his church. These fellowships groups in the greater churches of God are founded on the same cornerstone and foundation that the Old Testament prophesied. Let's start in the Old Testament with Isaiah 28. And then we can go to verse 16. So Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I place in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He who believes shall not be ashamed. Here is a prophecy of Jesus as the cornerstone and foundation of the church. Let's turn to Psalms and see more on this tried stone. Let's go to Psalm 118, and we'll go to verse 22. Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. Because we have the whole Bible, we know this cornerstone is Jesus, and it is clarified in the New Testament. But let's move forward a bit and go to Matthew 21 and turn to verse 42. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in scriptures the stone that the builders rejected? This has become the head of the corner. This was from the Lord and it is wonderful in our eyes. And if we turn to Ephesians in verses 19 and 20, we'll find, a, find the foundation we had to build upon. Ephesians 2, start in verse 19. But you are our fellow citizens with the saints and are the household of God. You are being built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. We have been given a tremendous gift, brethren, but it also comes with great responsibility. Not just on the elders and teachers, but on each of us as members of this body. We're being supplied with the proper building blocks to continue building this foundation. It's up to us to continue building with the proper materials, everything based on the Word of God. If we introduce anything contrary, it will not stand. In Matthew 7, Jesus tells a story about two men, one wise and one foolish, who each decided to build a house. Well, let's go to Matthew 7. And we'll start in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and practices them, I will compare him to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain came and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall for it was founded upon the rock, built on the word of God, the proper building materials. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not practice them shall be compared to a foolish man who built his house upon the sand improper or counterfeit building materials, the lies of man and man's traditions. The rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The wise man took more time and care in building his house. He built it on a stone foundation, the rock, so it would be able to withstand what the world threw at it, so to speak. 
He's been guiding us and building on that solid foundation too. Each week, he replenishes our stock with the right materials. How are we to know they're right? We are guided by what the Apostle Paul has told us in 1 Thessalonians 5. We go to 1 Thessalonians 5, turn to verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. I think this scripture here is probably lost on some of these mainstream churches and secular, secular groups. They don't understand that. They don't understand that we have to prove all things. When we first started getting together, I told people, I don't want you to believe anything that I tell you. I want you to use it as a guide to prove it for yourself. That's what we need to do. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Each week we go over studies, listen to sermons, and hear a lot of information. We must be able to discern man's version of truth from God's real truth. The more we're in God's word and the more we lessen the chances of being deceived, this is becoming more important each day uh, as each day goes by. Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, volcanoes, violent weather events, civil unrest, and probably worse of all, morally bankrupt government leaders who will do anything to further their agenda of controlling corruption to the detriment of all of us. And that's not restricted just to the United States. We we'll look at the things as, uh, as brought out each week in the live stream, how in Europe they're falling apart, Australia, uh, China's falling apart, their economy's going in the toilet. The whole world is just coming apart. Jesus warned us of this in Matthew 24 when asked by his disciples to clarify when some events he had spoken of would occur. The first thing he told them was, we'll go to Matthew 24, please, and we'll start in verse 3. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the comp uh, completion of the age? Then Jesus answered and said to them, Be on guard so that no one deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they shall deceive many. And you may hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you do not let these things disturb you. For it is necessary that these things take place, but the end is not yet. And if we drop down to verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall present many great signs and wonders, in order to deceive, if possible, even the elect. That's us, brethren. Three times in this chapter we are cautioned about being deceived. You think God feels that's important for us to know? He wants us to be prepared for these things, and we have to pay attention. Let's move to the Gospel of Luke. We'll go to chapter 22. Luke 22, and we'll come to verse 31. Then the Lord said, Simon, Simon, listen well. Satan has demanded to have you all, to sift as wheat. The Greek word for sift, according to Thea's definition as it was used here, means by inward agitation to try one's faith to the verge of overthrow. This is what we can expect and we must be watching for. Are we any different than these early disciples? I think not, especially in these end times. We should expect no less than other saints to have had uh, what the other saints have had to endure. Excuse me, endure. We know all things are to escalate, and those in God's true church are in Satan's main target, or his main focus. Several places in the Bible, it tells us what we can expect in the end times. We can plan on one or more of these issues to affect us. Let's go to 2 Peter 3. Come over to 2 Peter 3, and we'll start in verse 1. Now, beloved, I am writing this second epistle to you in both. I am stirring up your pure minds by cause, causing you to remember, in order for you to be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the Lord and Savior, spoken by us, the apostles. Knowing this first, that in the last days there will come mockers walking according to their own personal lust. And let's go to 2 Timothy 3, and we'll start in verse 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, braggarts, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankful, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, implacable slanderers without self-control, savage, despisers of those who are good, betrayers, reckless, egotistical, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, 
having an outward appearance of godliness, but denying the power of true godliness. But as for you, turn away from all these. For from such men as these come those who are worming their way into houses and are gaining control over empty-headed, gullible women, given over to various sins, being driven by all kinds of lust. They are always learning, but are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if we look at the way things are going and as, as on the live streams and as Fred has said before, we don't have to just read the Bible to find out what's going on or what's going to go on. We can see it occurring every single day on the uh, weekly news. And we know from the way that this woke crowd is handling things, it's not just empty-headed, gullible women. It's many empty-headed, gullible men and, and young people who are being deceived by these colleges and universities. These verses should be etched into our minds. These are some of the things we should be studying repeatedly and reinforcing our foundational knowledge so that no man deceives us. As we saw in Matthew 24, verses 3 to 5, we are to be aware of those trying to deceive us. These can be from outside as well as inside the church. I'd like to believe we'll be able to readily identify these outside sources. It's those who are within that is the most concern and should be. This is called to our attention again in 2 Peter uh, 2. So let's go to 2 Peter 2 and start in verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, as indeed there will be false teachers among you, who will stealthily introduce destructive heresies, personally denying the Lord who brought them and bringing swift destruction upon themselves and possibly that fellowship that they're in. And many people will follow as authoritative their destructive ways, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. This is talking about baptized members of the church. People we have trusted and studied with will end up introducing these false teachings. Again, we must be aware of these things. It's hard to believe things like this can happen to us, but look around the world. Did you ever expect this blatant sexualization and exploitation of almost everything we know? How about the lack of truth and moral boundaries and personal dealings and interactions among people? Part of the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy sets some guidelines for us. Well, let's turn to 1 Timothy, verse 6, and we'll see what uh, Paul has to say to Timothy. 1 Timothy, verse 6, and let's start in verse 3. If anyone teaches any different doctrine and does not adhere to sound words, even those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine that is according to godliness, he is proud and knows nothing. Rather, he is a morbid attraction to questions and disputes over words, from which come envy, arguments, blasphemy, wicked suspicions, vain reasonings of men who have been corrupted in their minds, are destitute of truth, men who believe that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw yourself. As we've learned, Satan always comes with a benefit. What is it that would get us to follow someone like this? Do they offer something that we think will benefit us? We should help one another as much as we can, but be aware when false teachings start appearing. Remember the cautions in Galatians 1. Let's go to Galatians 1, and we'll go to verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly being turned away from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which in reality is not another gospel. But there are some who are troubling you and are destroy, desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if we, or even an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel to you that is contrary to what we have preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, I also say again, if anyone is preaching a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. Scripture tells us we will know them by their fruits. We can find that in Matthew 7, verse 16. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not as mature enough and can be hard to identify. This is why we need to seek the advice and counsel of those who we know are rooted in God's word, another of the brethren uh, that you trust, or one of the elders. I'd like to share something with you. I listened to a country podcast recently, and the presenter made a good analogy. Satan always comes to us bearing gifts with something good. When something good comes our way, we need to look at it and pray about it. When we do, we'll realize that it is good, but it's not great. God's gifts and promises are great, so don't settle for good when you can have great. It seems straight to the point and easy to understand. But always remember, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21, prove all things. God's truth is the final answer. Because we are fallible humans and subject to human reasoning, 
we do have to avoid extremes in dealing with those with these issues. We cannot take these things personally. We cannot take authority to ourselves that we have not been given. When we become self-righteous, we risk crossing the line ourselves. On the other hand, we cannot tolerate sin or the introduction of false teachings within the group. Sin within the group is not conducive to proper Bible study and learning. It leads to a heavy atmosphere of tension, which is good for no one. The authority and guidance we are to follow are all listed in the Bible. God's word is the guide we are to use. We are not the final authority. God is. We know his desire is that no man perishes. Let's turn to 2 Peter 3, and we'll go to verse 9. 2 Peter 3, and verse 9. The Lord is not delaying the promises of his coming, as some in their own minds reckon delay. Rather, he's long-suffering towards us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's strong desire. He wants us all. And we try to, when we have our fellowship groups, one of the things that we bring out, because we're all human, is that we can't be tailbearers against other people. We have to realize that even people who have wronged us are people that God loves as much as he loves us. He doesn't want any of us to perish, and we have to keep that in mind. We need to keep in mind also that we serve him and his church. It's our collective duty to lead and guide the brethren and each other as we are able. As time goes by, we're going to have more people led to the church, especially at the end times. Some may come from the churches of God, uh, of some of the splinter groups. Some may come from secular churches and are seeking truth. Some may come from non-believing background and started searching on their own, and they were led to us. In any event, we need to be able to lead and guide them. These, those that follow up in the truth, believe, repent, and are baptized, will be like the workmen in the field who are called at different times, respond, and are rewarded with the same reward as those called earlier. Let's go to Matthew 20 and review this parable of the workmen. Matthew 20, and let's start in verse 1. The kingdom of heaven shall be compared to a man, a master of a house, who went out early in the morning to hire workmen for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the workmen on a silver coin for a day's wage, he sent them into the vineyard. And when he went about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And again, he said to them, go also to the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. And they went. And again, after going out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, Go also into my vineyard, and whatever is right you shall receive. We have to understand others will always be coming to the church, hired after us, who will receive the same chance. This is all part of God's plan. Let's go to verse 8 and continue on. And when evening came, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the workmen and pay them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour came, they each received a silver coin. And when the first ones came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a silver coin. And after receiving it, they complained against the master of the house. Those hired early received the same pay as everyone else, and they were upset. And those who came to him uh, complained to the master of the house, and they said, These came... These who came last have worked one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have carried the burden in the heat of the day. But he answered and said to them, Friend, I'm not doing you wrong. Did you not agree with me on a silver coin for the day? Take what is yours and go, for I also desire to give to the last ones exactly as I gave to you. And is, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with that which I own? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many are called, but few are chosen. We can see that not all were comfortable or happy with this arrangement. God has called all of us to be part of his family and his fellowship, and he'll be calling more in the future. He has set the path before us all. He has and will continue to faithfully lead us as long as we remain faithful to him. As we continue on into the end time scenario, we'll be able to help those who are called after us. Some will have more time in the world than in the, in the truth and may have similar experiences that would allow them to relate more easily with those called later. With their previous time in the world, they may be able to better mentor these newly called 
and help them to understand God's truth, God's truth and how it relates to all things, starting with the glory of his creation and right up to dealing with the problems in their lives. Many will be called. Those who endure to the end will be chosen. All of us will be tasked to mentor others. We need to depend on that solid foundation we are building on the rock. We also have to remember that most important part, we will not be able to accomplish anything if we do not have the love of God. God the Father and Jesus Christ love us and all mankind tremendously. John was the apostle that Jesus loved. He wrote more about love of God than any other of the apostles. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, we're given the beginning instructions of why and how we are to worship God. Let's turn to John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world, each and every one of us, as we said earlier, that he gave his only begotten Son so that everyone who believes in him not a one-time profession, but a continuing commitment to love and obey him and to keep his commandments. May not perish, but may have everlasting life. And that is our reward, brethren. Jesus' prayer to the Father before his arrest and crucifixion shows his love for not only the original apostles, but also for us. Please turn to the Gospel of John, and let's go to chapter 17. John 17, and let's go to verse 20. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who shall believe in me through, your, through their word. That includes us, brethren. We're believing in the word of the Lord through the words professed, prophesied in, and told to us through the New Testament and the Gospels. That they may also be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, in order that the world may believe that you did send me and have given them the glory that you gave to me, in order that they may be one, in the same way that we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be perfected into one, and that the world may know that you did send me, and have loved them as you have loved me. The love of Jesus and God the Father for us is further clarified by John. Let's go to 1 John 1, and we'll start in verse 1. 1 John 1. In verse 1, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our own eyes, that which we observe for ourselves and our own hands handled concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and are bearing witness and are reporting to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and have heard, we are reporting to you in order that you also may have fellowship with us. For the fellowship, indeed our fellowship, is with the Father and with his own Son, Jesus Christ. These things we are also writing to you, so that your joy may be completely filled. Brethren, all of us have been given a great opportunity. We have been called to be a part of God's family, to be with him for eternity. We know deception and false prophets are to have a prominent place as we progress toward the end times. Look at the lies and deceptions right now within the government and the high-tech industry. We will need to depend on God's word. This fellowship and our brethren and our relationship with other true churches of God. Building and maintaining our spiritual foundation is critical. This is all part of it. Plus, he has given us a great instruction manual to help us. When we read the Bible, we should study how Jesus and the apostles dealt with life and use those teachings to guide us in our personal lives and teaching and counseling others. It is God's inspired written word. Let's turn to 2 Timothy in chapter 3. This is important for us to convey to any new people coming in, because a lot of them are skeptical on this old book that we all so much depend on. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's go to verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for conviction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. God's scripture, his love for us and our love for him and the brethren, will allow us to build and maintain that foundation. Our relationship with one another and other true believers will help us shore it up and keep it strong. We have to realize our ingrained human frailties and understand we are not going to solve any spiritual problems with human wisdom or reasoning. Let's close with this. Please turn to James chapter 3. 
James chapter 3, and let's start in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him demonstrate his works through good conduct in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Because where bitter envying and selfish ambition are, there is no dissension. There is dissension and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Brethren, thank you so much for having us with you. We are so honored to be part of this fellowship group and part of our affiliation with Christian Biblical Church of God, and so honored that the elders and all of those in the church administration and uh, Fred Coulter are doing so much to ensure that this ministry continues on through as long as it needs to continue. So thank you so much for having me. God bless and have a great Sabbath. Thank you.